Hey, good morning. Don't, don't worry about that part. Hey, yeah, so John Tripp, um, I just have the blessing of being up here. And um, we're actually, this is the season, or this is the, the series of Huli, right? We're actually closing it up. And what we've been talking about is the Sermon on the Mount, right, and Jesus' teachings. So we have Matthew 7, which is actually the ending of it, and I'm going to get started, and Pastor Mark will finish it. Um, but we'll get right into it, right? There, there's so many good topics that is talked about in this, this part. You could, you could do a full sermon on each one. You really could. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go over, you know, some layers and we'll talk about it. But the first one, and, you know, we, I'm sure we can all relate, is judgment, right? I've been wrong on many judgments, right? I think we all have. I've been so far wrong. I've been a little bit wrong. I've been right. But the thing is, is that we, we, we all have this natural place of judgment. And uh, share a story. I remember I was going to a, a small group, and there was this, this girl there. She was not like me. She was wearing baggy um, this baggy shirt, it was like purple and, and white, and it was striped. And I remember, because uh, I'm 25, and she's I'm going to be a couple days. Uh, but, and so is she, and, I, and she's jumping on the trampoline, and I'm like, okay, girl, get it. Like, that's not me, right? But you go do you. And uh, I was like, you know, from my initial assessment, you seem really cool, and you're going to be a good friend, right? Not even thinking girlfriend or anything like that. That was my initial judgment. Um, well, now she's my girlfriend, and she's over there. Uh, and don't worry, I asked if I could talk about this, right? Um, now she proved me wrong in so many ways and um, just showed me another uh, blessing that I have in my life. And you don't really know what God's going to do in your life, especially if it's covered by judgment, right? Especially our initial judgment. But yeah, let's get right into Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 1. We're starting about judgment. Jesus is finishing up his teaching, or he's getting into towards the end. He says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eyes? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. There's three layers that we're going to go over in this teaching um, about why we don't judge. I just hopefully this will break it down. Number one, it releases the other person from unattainable perfection. You know, there's certain people, and I'm sure you guys can think, that they're so wrong. They're, they're, they're sinners. They're so wrong all the time that they're, they're not going to be right, right? You just expect them to kind of be wrong, right? We have people like that. And then there's the exact opposite, which is, oh, my gosh, I hold this person at such a level, they're never allowed to be wrong, right? It could be your boss, right? You're like, oh, they messed up, but they're the boss, right? Or I said this earlier, it could be a pastor, and you're like, oh, no, this pastor's supposed to be perfect. <laughs> that's, that's not you know, realistic. Nobody's perfect. By not judging others, you're giving the authority back to God. You're giving the responsibility of them back to God. And it also gives them a chance to turn back to God. We can't be quick to judge. Number two, it relieves you from pride. It will really humble you, right? Let's, let's try this out. So what I want you guys to do is think of somebody that frustrates you. Think of uh, just that person. It could be a sibling. It could be a, a coworker. It could be a boss. It could be a family member, right? Think of them that frustrates you, right? Now, tomorrow, somebody comes up and says, oh, so-and-so got arrested. What's your first thought? It was like, oh, I, I figured I expected that, or dang, you know, kind of saw that coming. They're super frustrating, <laughs> right? And the next, right, the next day that comes after, someone else comes to you and says, hey, I'm pretty sure that they're wrongly accused of what they're arrested for. 
Now, now what kind of goes through your head? Are you sitting there and are you asking yourself, well, you know, I doubt it. I bet you they're right. And you've made this prejudgment that eh, they're probably right. right. You have different ways of uh, thinking about it. But I heard it this way, and it was very well said. It was, sometimes we seek information that justifies our narrative, and it's almost like an aha moment, because it justifies what we want to believe in, that narrative, right? C.S. Lewis, he, he says it this way, and it's long, and I'll try and read it to where I can understand it as well. Suppose one reads a story of filthy atrocities in the paper, Then suppose that something turns up suggesting that the story might not quite be true or not quite so bad as it was made out. Is their first feeling, thank God, even they aren't quite so bad as that? Or is it a feeling of disappointment and even a determination to cling to the first story for the sheer pleasure of thinking your enemies are as bad as possible? He goes on and he finishes with, We shall insist on seeing everything, then, God, our friends, ourselves included, as bad, and not being able to stop doing it, we shall be fixed forever in a universe of pure hatred. C.S. Lewis is saying that through judgment and comparison, that leaves no one able of being perfect. And in turn, everyone is bad. You could take the first side of that story and say, Okay, well, now that it was watered down, they're not as bad because I don't want to see them as that bad. It supports my narrative. Or we could see the opposite of that and be like, hey, actually, I don't believe your version of the story. How often do we do that with what we see on TV? I don't believe your version because it does not fit my narrative, right? We'd cling to the old, but that's, that's judgment, right? We're holding on to versions, versions of stories that justify our hatred, Stopping judgment releases us from the bondage of hatred, is what it does. But there's really good news to this. The same way that we have opinions and feelings, and and what a judge does is it makes a decision based on someone else's actions. That's what a judge does, right? But we, we're, we're, we're flawed. We have emotions. The good news is that there are there is one good judge, and we're relieved of that duty. That's not our job. That's God's. God is a good judge. And, and that's really helpful because it's fair, it's just, right? We don't have to leave it to ourselves. We thought about it this way, and what it does is when we not judge, when we're not judging, it turns a them problem into a we problem, right? It turns sitting there being like, they're wrong, they're wrong, or they've got an issue, they've got an issue, issue into a we problem. One thing that was really cool, if you look at the way Jesus' ministry was, is one, there's God in the flesh, and he came down because at first he was away and he was, you know, above, and he was still there, but he wasn't what they could see. But he came down in flesh, and he walked with each and every person, and he was with them. It was a we thing. He addressed the issue, and then they walked with him. Follow me, right? Super awesome. It turned a you problem or turn the them problem into a we problem. And that's like super awesome that we get to do this with Christ. We get to do this with our awesome, loving Father, right? And that brings us right into the third point. It changes our hearts towards others. This heart change starts a transformation. It, it de-escalates your judgment for others. It, it makes it easier to empathize. It makes it easier to actually forgive, like truly forgive, right? We made this phrase that says, uh, not judging others helps you become a conduit, not a critic, right? This actually allows, when you're not judging, the spirit to work through you, right? But when you're judging, you become the critic. Apostle Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. This verse emphasizes that ultimately God is who brings growth and transformation. Jesus says it another way. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father 
except through me. It's important to remember that we are the conduits and not the source. Right? <clears throat> Let's avoid being the critic in people's lives and start being the conduits for the Spirit. Definitely. The next section goes over um, asking, asking God, right, for things. And I'll read through it. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? Amen, just that. Three layers. What does it imply about God? God is a good father. He is a good father. In case you don't know him, he wants to give you good gifts. He does. And just like how we have father figures and fathers walking into Father's Day weekend, right? We have, they've provided for us, and yet they were still flawed, but they did their best. But guess what? You have a good God that gives you spiritual things, that gives you strength, and is good and cares about you. Number two, it releases you from self-reliance. It releases you from having to have it all figured out. It releases you from having to have a retirement plan. It releases you from thinking that what I'm doing is the only way that this is going to get me here. Right? That's just not true. It actually invites you to long for spiritual things. And, it, and also at the same time, it releases you from being like, this is too small for God. This is too big for God. That's not important. It actually invites you to speak and to ask God. He definitely wants that. I remember this, this concept, I've seen it play out, and it was with my initial, uh, my initial come to Christ, right? As an adult, as, as a person who got to experience and feel the love of God. It was when I had been super, um, I'd been in the Navy for long enough, or just like throughout life, and I'd had many like critiques, and people were like, Hey, John, you know, you're really cool, but when I first met you, I didn't know about you. And I'm like, man, that stinks. First impressions, right? And so, and I heard that enough times that I'm like, man, my first impression is not that good. <laughs> like, to be honest. Like, I, so I wanted to do something about it. And so, of course, I went and I read some self-help books. And I'm not knocking them. They're great, too, you know. Um, but I went, and I remember being a pastor's kid. My dad was like, there's this guy, Jesus, and he teaches really cool things, and they're really helpful, right? And so I'm like, okay, Dad, let's test this theory out. I opened up my Bible, and I started reading about Jesus, starting the Gospels. The first thing I did was I started asking the questions, how do I change? How do I be a better person? I started asking. And then I eventually came to this, my Bible. And then I started seeking, and I'm like, okay, Jesus, I've heard about you. I didn't have like this, like, deep connection yet, you know. I've heard about it. I started seeking it, and, and it started to make sense to me. I started to learn who Jesus was, his character, who God was, and then it was like, okay, now it's time to ask God, work through me, because I've tried myself, and I just don't know how. And so I started to knock, and I started to ask, Lord, work through me, change me, because I was tired of, you know, having a bad first impression. It was bigger than that. I was tired of not being a good person. <laughs> but, you know, so ask, seek, knock. It goes into this next one. It ties. What does it do for you? It gives you humility. It repositions your heart back into gratitude, into God's gifts. If you think about when I first you know, met Christ, when I first started reading my Bible, let's just start there. When I first started reading my Bible, I was not walking in a way that was honoring God. I was walking in sin, not just the sin that you hear about. I was just not, I didn't know God. I didn't walk towards God. I didn't even think to like, hey, I need to do these things because I need to be this, right? And yet he still recognized me in my place, put it in my heart, and he still loved me through that. He was loving me even 
as I hadn't yet even figured out who he was, he had a plan for me, and he still does, right? His love is unconditional. His love is unconditional. Whereas me, that was not what I was thinking. We're in this series of Huli. He flips it. Jesus flips this teaching, and he shows us that God's love is unconditional, and our love is conditional, right? The same way that God shows me grace, that showed me grace, I should be doing that same thing for others, and I can't do it with judgment, right? Verse 12 says, so in everything, Jesus is teaching, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Again, Jesus hoolies this conditional type of love that we have, and he's talking about God's unconditional love. Do unto others, right? I'll give you a few examples. Be kind to others so that they are kind to you. That's not what he says. That's, that's a karma-based way of thinking, and it's self-serving, and it's very conditional. I, I'm only supposed to do this if you do that for me, right? Here's another one. Be nice to people so that they're nice to me. Don't hurt others so that they won't hurt you. Well, that's also... It's conditional. It's self-protecting, right? But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. As you would have them do unto you. It's unconditional because the love we show isn't based on how we're treated. It's on how we value other people. God's love is unconditional. And he's trying to teach us how to share the same grace as we receive with other people. It's super important. He hoolies our way of thinking from, hey, this is, a, this is how you should do it because this is what you gain from it, to this is how you do it because you've already gained because he is sufficient. And he, is, he calls us to be just as loving as he is loving to us, right, in this last teaching. But as we're wrapping up this series on Huli, Pastor Mark's going to come up here and he's going to finish with some more ways that Jesus really hoolies our perceptions and he, and he wraps it up. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Good job. Wow. Awesome job, John. So good. And um, just to pick up on that same token, that Jesus kind of wraps this, this really interesting, uh, the golden rule, we call it, to treat others as you would have them treat you. He wraps that up with after ask, seek, and knock. And there's this kind of invitation that the same way God is generous with us as a father who gives good gifts. So then ought you be generous with how you treat other people. Amen. So this is what Jesus, I love how John said that this is a, a huli against our own conditional love into growing in the unconditional love of Christ. So Jesus doesn't end there. This is how crazy Jesus, there's like seven hanahos in this thing. Like Jesus, you think, oh, he's got to end it right there. And he's like, everyone's like, oh, no, oh, tell us more. And Jesus hits him again and hits him again. So here's the next hit that Jesus comes at. Verse uh, 13. He says this. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow, and the way is constricted that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And Jesus is using this language of gates and roads, right? There's two gates and two roads. There's a wide path and a wide gate that's going to lead to destruction, and there's a narrow path, a narrow gate that's going to lead to life. And we know this. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We know this. But he's kind of using this language almost thinking about sheep. Sheep have to go through roads and through gates to get where they're going. So for us to be a sheep, he's saying, how hard is it to bottleneck a, a whole herd of sheep into a narrow path? Only few are going to make it. And now this isn't a, a, a statement of condemnation where Jesus is like, whoa, some of you suckers not going to make them. Sorry. This isn't what he's saying. What he's saying is, guys, this is the reality. People are going to choose destruction, and this should propel our hearts to go to Argentina. Right? This should propel our hearts to start talking to our coworkers a little bit more intentionally. Because there is a path that leads to destruction. Many of us see it, but out of fear of being non-judgmental, we don't 
say anything. We don't lead people. We don't invite them to church on Father's Day, whatever it might be. But we have to have the depth of love for people to say that the narrow path is worth it. Amen? And if we aren't convinced that the narrow path of following Jesus is worth it, then we're going to allow people to go down the wide path and be like, have fun, right? This is, this is an invitation that Jesus is giving us. That, the, guys, there's two roads here, and he's making it really clear for us. Some of us, we're not like, wait, am I on the narrow path or the wide path? It's not always so easy to tell. And Jesus is using these dichotomies, these kind of black and white type of thinking to make us really be decisive and to really know with clarity, are we truly following Jesus or are we not with every part of our life? And he, because he's going to keep going. He doesn't end here. You think like, this is harsh. Wait till you see the next verse, <laughs> right? But this is the idea is when he says that this, some people look at this and they're like, that Jesus is so judgmental. That Jesus is so, uh, didn't he just preach about not being judgmental? Why is he so, um, is he like a bouncer in the club? And he's like, oh, only a few people can get in. No, no, no. Jesus is saying, this is the reality. The invitation is for everyone, right? One of the best ways I heard it said is this, is that the kingdom of heaven is for anyone, but it's not for everyone. Anyone who gives their life to Jesus is welcome in, but not everyone's going to come. And so this is the truth of the reality of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is finishing with. He wants us to get the direness of this, yeah? So Jesus teaching, and when we talk about this, we come to church every week, we talk about the kingdom of heaven and Jesus and following him, and it's always, always like super good, encouraging stuff, but sometimes Jesus hits us with the stuff that's like, wow, there's a real kind of fork in the road. There's a real decision to be made. And he's going to kind of unpack that a little bit more as he keeps going. We're going to skip a little bit down to verse 21. Again, this is like people like, Hanaho, and Jesus is like, you sure? (laughs) Try watch. To verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. I wish Jesus didn't say this, to be honest. I wish I could tell you right now. That Jesus said, everyone who just says, Lord, Lord, to Jesus, ah, you're saved because you called him Lord. But look at who, what, how he follows in verse 22. He says, it's not just about calling me Lord. That's not enough. Verse 22, many of you will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And didn't in your name we cast out demons and perform many miracles? So what he asked us to do, right? Slay demons. Perform miracles, do many, many beautiful signs and wonders on behalf of God, prophesy in his name. Look at how he responds. He's like, I'm going to declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me for, those, for you who practice lawlessness. This is one of the harshest things that, we, that Jesus truly says in Scripture. And one of the things we have to recognize is heart here. His heart here is, is not Jesus trying to be exclusive and trying to be like, hey, no, 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 like, trying to make us, give us more hoops to jump through, so to speak. He's saying this, and he hits this through the last three chapters of the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6. He says the same thing. Your outward righteousness isn't enough to get you saved. He said that to the Pharisees. Don't be like the hypocrites who think that they can just kind of get in the street and declare their praises for the Lord publicly because it's not actually about the praise to him. It's about their own recognition. He says, don't think that that's going to save you. He says, I never knew you. You can do things in my name. This is the scary part, church. You can do things in the name of God without him. This is the, di- this is the distinction he's making. He says, stop doing things for me if you're not going to do them with me. This is what Jesus is looking for. And he's going to hit this nail on the head because he is tired. He's coming to a place of, of religiosity to the Jews, who people who are doing all the right things with the wrong heart. That's hypocrisy in Jesus' eyes. And he says, don't be like those hypocrites who are doing all these great things, but they're not doing it with the right heart. And he's kind of, kind of like in between the lines, he's kind of showing us what is the right heart. You're doing it in fellowship with the Messiah, with Jesus. He wants to know you. Amen. Jesus says in in John chapter 10, he says that the people who follow me are my sheep. My sheep know my voice. I'm their shepherd and they know the voice of their shepherd. Do you know the voice of your shepherd? This is the question for us. Do you know his voice authentically? Because many of us will get, it's easy to get in the rut of, I come to church, I serve, I do these things, I do these, Lord, I'm doing all this in your name, but you're kind of leaving the Lord out of it. So the woe to those who do all the right things for the Lord, but not with him. 
This is the invitation. Do you have the type of faith to bring the Lord along with you? Here's the good news. If you're looking at this and being like, oh, Pastor Mark, I don't know if I want to get to the end. And Jesus is like, I never knew you. You're like, ah, here's the good news. You just got to get to know him, right? Just know him, and many of us already do. Here's the beautiful thing. You don't have to tangibilize that. We don't have to kind of make a methodology to knowing God. You know in your na'au if you know the Lord, if you have a relationship with him. He has a unique love and compassion for you. He has a unique way of talking with you. If you know him, you know him. You know what I mean? If you're confused on that, we're going to pray over you so that you might know him today. Amen? But this is the, this is the invitation can you not just do the righteous things, but be righteous as you partner with me? And Jesus is asking us through this very harsh statement. <laughs> Many of you are going to say, Lord, Lord, we did all these great things. He's like, I never knew you, right? This is kind of a kickback to Exodus where, um, you know, the Ten Commandments. He says, thou shall not use the Lord's name in vain. This is what he's talking about. You guys are using my name to do things, but you're not doing it for me or with me. You're doing it for some other motivation. It's using the Lord's name in vain. So for us as believers today, we have to be really wary of this. If, if everything we're doing in faith is not deeply grounded in my love for the Lord and my love for others and my like, diligent duty to follow Jesus with everything I have, then we have to ask the question, am I doing this for the right reason? Am I actually doing it with the Lord and is Jesus a part of it, my everyday being? Amen. So here's what this looks like. Do you wake up every morning and invite the Lord to be a part of your day? When you pray, do you pray to him in a unique way that he knows you hear his voice and vice versa? Do you listen and read the word and hear his voice? Because most of us, we know how the Lord sounds. We know how the Lord compels our hearts. And this is a really, really important thing. For me, um, I, and it actually just hit me when John was talking on the judgment part. Just about three weeks ago, I had a dream. This is how the Lord was speaking to me. There's one person in my life that's like a thorn in my flesh. He's been for a while. And every time people talk to me about him, like John was saying, I choose a narrative that keeps him in the margins. Does that make sense? Because I'm like, oh, yeah, he's this and this and that. I've, I have judgment. I have condemnation over him. Easy to keep him down there. And I had this dream, and it was weird, and God made it really clear what it meant. When I was dreaming, I was spearfishing. So I had one spear, and I was in there. There were five eels swimming. And so in my mind, I'm like, oh, I'm going to tag one of these eels. And I never eat eels. I don't know why, like, that God didn't give me, like, I don't know, uhu or something, like something delicious in my dream. But they're eels. What happened was as I started chasing them with my spear gun, they all started turning into people. So I was like, ah. But one of them quickly turned into a person, and I shot him anyway. And then I got out of the water, and people were yelling. They're like, why did you just shoot that person with your spear? I'm like, no, no, that was, that was one eel. It's not my fault. This one eel is my eel. They literally chased me down the beach. And I woke up, and I was like, what was that about? And it made me really clear. Like, the Lord spoke to me, like, really clearly about that one. He was like, Mark, you're still thinking people are eels and shooting at them when I've totally redeemed them already. If I've forgiven them, why are you still shooting spears at them? And I was like, oh, my gosh. This is how the Lord is going to speak to us. And as we wrap up the Huli series, here's the invitation. When God speaks, he sets things into motion. When we listen to the teachings of Jesus, this isn't like, oh, that's a fun idea. Jesus is a great teacher. This is a, oh my gosh, he's shifting the entirety, like the nature of our cosmos every time Jesus speaks. And so this is something that, that the word of God, as Jesus preaches, these things are going to constantly pursue us. These teachings are going to constantly convict us if we let them. Amen? This is what it means to have a relationship with the Lord, is that I'm free game, Lord, for what you want to do in my life. If you want to convict me, convict me. If you want to encourage me, encourage me. But regardless, I know that even when the Lord convicts me and it doesn't feel nice, I have this, because <sighs> I know I have a relationship with him. I know that he speaks to me and I hear his voice, yeah? And it can be different for everybody. If you're one of those left brain people and you're like, I don't know if I, I know what the voice of the Lord sounds like, Pastor Mark. Like, I don't have like an emotional connection to Jesus. I just, it's more cognitive. Here's the good news. The Lord knows you like the hair on your head. He knows you in and out. And he will show up in ways that make sense to you. He will show up in ways that will love you. And so be encouraged that as you, as John said, ask and seek and knock, we have a Messiah who's behind the door waiting to meet you and have a relationship with you. Amen? 
So that's a beautiful, beautiful thing about our God. So you thought he was done there, right? You're like, how could Jesus get any more than that? <laughs> he, he ain't done yet. So verse 24, ho, Jesus. This is how he finishes his most immaculate, I imagine, five-hour sermon on the mountain. He says this, Therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine, and what? Acts on them. They will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against the house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and the collapse was great. Here's what, how we kind of, I grew up thinking about this first. Oh, if you have faith in Jesus, you're building your house on the rock. So if I just believe in these things, how I listen to his teachings, and I'm like, this is great. Great idea, Jesus, right? I took that comparative religion class, and this Jesus guy, he's better than those other guys. He has the best ideas. I like him. This is fun, right? If we allow the teaching to stay here, but not activate us into our behaviors, into the way we actually love people, he's like, you're still building your house on the sand. This is the invitation for us, family, is can you take... Jesus' most incredible sermon, and all the other teachings too, and find a way for the Spirit of God to activate them in your life so that it's going to change your heart, it's going to change people around you, and the kingdom of God's going to grow. That's the invitation. The invitation isn't just to stay with a hulied mindset and be like, hey, Jesus taught this, do you believe him? Most of us would be like, yeah, good. Don't just talk about it, be about it. Amen? That's what he's saying. Blessed are the ones who are being about it because the ones who be about it, their house is built on the rock. Why? Because the word of God never comes back void and it changes and transforms things. So if Jesus has said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, then you'll be like, whew, that changes my heart, but it actually puts me into motion. You once heard... Eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Now I tell you, if someone strikes you across the cheek, turn the other one and let him slap the other side. Yeah, but did he really mean that? No, he, mean, he meant it. Right? Put that into motion. What about pray? How many of us pray, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Or do we pray, Lord, I want my will. Can you make it happen? This is a difference. Do you actually pray it? Do you put the prayer that God gave us in the sermon into motion? If you act on them, your house will be sturdy like built on a rock. It takes action, family. If you believe in the things that Jesus teaches, but have yet found a way to put them into motion, I'm so sorry, you're still going to be finding yourself in the sand when the storm comes. Because the transformation happens when we put into motion the words of Jesus. Amen? Does that make sense? It's not the ideas that transform. It's the ideas that have been the the spirit implants in our hearts and it just changes from the inside out. So we have to be active. So this is something that I want to make very clear because many of us will sit here and be like, yes, I believe this, hallelujah, amen, but then go out there and we don't turn the other cheek. We don't pray God's will on earth, right? And we don't say that, oh, I'm an adulterer because I lust too. All the things that Jesus taught, we don't take seriously the things that he taught and actually put them into motion. So the question, here's the two big invitations for Jesus gives to us. Two invitations. Are we okay? Good. Amen. Just checking. Because these are two invitations. I feel like when Jesus preaches, he's preaches seriously. <laughs> he's like, guys, there's, a real two, there's really two roads and there's two paths. He's, he means this. Two invitations. Number one, Jesus put Jesus' teachings into motion. If you've been listening to the Holy series for the last month or two, and you're saying, oh my gosh, Jesus totally flips the paradigms of how we think in this world, Are you actually putting that into motion? Are you living that way? Are you living in this upside down world where the kingdom of God, the things that are spiritual are so much more important than the things that are carnal? The way that we give, the way that we love, the way that we treat other people, the way that we worship God privately in our closets rather than outwardly in the streets. Are these things that we're putting into motion? Put them into motion. And number two, Jesus really wants this out of us. Don't just do things for God, but do things with him. Can we be the type of people that invite the presence of God into every ounce of our being, into everything that we're doing? 
If you're grocery shopping, invite Jesus with you. If you wake up in the morning, right? If you're yelling at your kids, invite Jesus to yell at your kids with you. For real. But this is what the invitation is. God has given us this beautiful thing. When Jesus died and rose again, he didn't just say like, hey, I've conquered sin and death and now it's pow forever. He said, oh wait, but one more thing. We're co-laboring. The kingdom of God will be made known because of believers like us partnering with the Holy Spirit to see new things happen in this world. Amen? That's what we're doing. So in this co-laboring, guess what? We get kuleana. You and I, all of us do. And we get kuleana to each other. We get kuleana to the Lord. And we're going to see, we're going to expect as we move from here today, that as we put into motion the things that Jesus taught, the same way God said, let there be light, and poof, the cosmos happened, the same way when he says, A, love one another as you would ought to be loved, poof, our worlds are going to be changed. Amen. Do we believe that? Amen. Does, do any more than three people believe that this morning? Amen. Good. Come on. Okay. Because they're like, huh? Guys, Jesus meant what he said. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray. And here's what the invitation for you. If you don't know if you have a relationship with Jesus, if I use that language, do you have a relationship with Jesus? And you're like, I don't know. We want to pray for you this morning. And we want to pray, not pray for you in, in pity, pray for you that you would know the voice of your shepherd with clarity, and that you would know the depth of love that he has for you. And that you'd leave this place knowing that everything I do, I'm going to do with him. And God's going to absolutely wreck my life and hooli my situations because I have the Messiah who is good, like a father who gives good gifts. So would you stand with me? We're going to pray this together. This is a prayer of activation. We have a lot of space in our world to get information. There's a lot of sermons you can watch online. There's a lot of books you can read. But how often do you wake up in the morning and say, Lord, activate my faith. Knock on his door and say, Lord, it's time for something new. The way that John shared. Lord, I'm tired of acting like this. I'm tired of giving bad first impressions because my character is not good. Lord, knock. Knock on that door. Lord, I'm here. Let's ask and seek and knock this morning and see what the Lord might want to do. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we just thank you so much for this good news of the gospel. This good news that we are not alone. And not only are we not alone, we're not the source. We thank you, Lord, that we are not the judge of other people. Father, release us from the burden of judgmentalism that burdens our hearts. Father, help us to forgive others as you have forgiven us. Help us to be generous with others as you have been generous with us. Lord, holy, our carnal temptation to try to be our own source, to be self-reliant and self-righteous. Jesus, come in and just wreck that whole thing. Give us a humility, a poorness in spirit to say, Lord, we need you and above everything else, nothing more but you. Forgive us, Lord, when we get performative in our faith, when we stand before you, but our hearts are actually looking for something for ourselves. Father, help us not to be like the hypocrites. Father, we thank you that the law has been fulfilled in Christ. We thank you that no longer do we merely just have to obey laws, but now we have the power of being transformed by your Holy Spirit so that the law can come alive in our hearts, that holiness can be birthed by the righteousness given to us through Christ, that we don't have to work for our righteousness, but it's been given through him. We thank you, Jesus. And a good, what a reminder this morning, God, that we are not our own, that we belong to you. Jesus, we just pray this morning for a depth of love for those who are on the wide path that leads to destruction. We pray, God, that we wouldn't just honor them, tiptoe around them, give them a water bottle and say, keep going. This path will be great. But Father, we would just have the burden of you, you, the son who pursues the lost sheep to say, come back to the narrow path. There's righteousness here. There's flourishing here. There's goodness here. Father, we pray that your name would be so glorified, so magnified that others would hear it and they would be resurrected in new life. Jesus, don't stop working. Stop making, we pray, Lord, that we wouldn't make this a hypothetical thing, but the power of your spirit would make it real a tangible touch of your presence, God. Father God, we just pray this morning. Father, for a holy that we know the transformation starts in our hearts. 
We thank you, Lord, that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. We thank you, Jesus, for these teachings that change our minds, to change our hearts, to keep us going out and pursuing people in love. And so, Lord, we just pray for, God, a deep revelation of your goodness to us. Father, I thank you for the relationship you have with each one here. We thank you for the confidence we have to know that we know you. And Jesus, we just ask this morning that this next season would be one of such a depth of relationship with you. We'd fall in love with you over again. We'd be grateful for the things we have, not just point out the things we lack. Father God, just come and have your way in us. And as you taught us to pray, Lord, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today what we need today. Forgive us of our trespasses, Lord, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. God, because yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. It's for your glory alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.